Now, this week at the Agenda saw us put the spotlight on the many challenges of being a millennial, those young people born from the early 1980s to the early 2000s. We called the series, Dude, Where's My Future? The Agenda's Week in Review begins with our so-called Young People's Agenda. Where are you from? I'm from, I was born in Scarborough, Ontario, but I was raised in a small town called Curtis, Ontario. Called what? Curtis, Ontario. Curtis. Where Just east of Oshawa. East of Oshawa. Yes, okay. Yes. Uh, where'd you go to a post-secondary? Carleton University. And you spent how long there? Four years because it was an honors program. Okay. And what'd you graduate with? Graduated with an honors degree in criminology and criminal justice with a minor in economics. And what year was that that you graduated? 2006. 2006. Yes. So you've been out for seven years. Mm -hmm. We need a little catching up on what it's been like for you over those seven years to find the right job. What did you start doing? I ended up getting a job at h and which I kept until I graduated from university, then entered the corporate world, which happened to be in March of 2007, where I got a six-month contract working for a multinational American financial company, and during which I was told that if I proved myself, I'd be able to get full-time, which is permanent benefits, et cetera, and so right. forth. And? What, would, what ended up happening was marginal contract extensions with one dollar an hour pay increases, plus witnessing mass layoffs both for full-timers and contractors, as well as changing two departments. It became obvious that there was going to be no future at this particular company. But by that point in time, it was mid-2008, during the economic collapse. Hmm. So many companies were either hire, were going through hiring increases or laying off people or a combination of both. How long have you been unemployed for? I've been unemployed, this is my third time unemployed from the past seven years, and I've been unemployed for five months as of last week. Five months? Yes. Are you hanging in there? It, I got good days and bad days. Uh, in terms of jobs applied for, as of last week, I, I average around 10 to 15 jobs a week, which adds up to around two to 300 jobs. Job interviews, you mean? Or no, no, applications. Oh, applications. Yeah, okay. just to submit online. But in terms of actual interviews, I've reached from those two to three hundred. From those two to three hundred applications, I've made it to six initial screenings, five phone interviews, and three in-person interviews. Laura. <laughs> Hi. Hi. You're at uh, Ryerson right now. Yes. How long you been there? I just started my master's last week, actually. Oh, so what'd you do your undergrad in? I did my undergrad in history at Queen's University. Okay, and so you did what, three or four years in Kingston? Four years in honors, BA, history. Gotcha, and, and now a couple of years in Ryerson? Um, no, I was working for three years after I graduated in different government jobs. Wait um, a second, you're, t you're 24? Yes. Okay, take me through. So what, 18 to 22 you were in at Kingston? Queens, yes, and then immediately upon graduating, I got a job working at uh, the GHG20 Summits as a media officer. And from there, because I was newly, freshly graduated, I just met so many different people from different government sectors and agencies and landed a job. Um, it was, it's, they're all, they've all been in healthcare. Um, so I've been doing different administrative work in healthcare, which isn't an uh, ideal job for me because I'm not interested in healthcare with a history degree. <laughs> but as an arts major, I took what I got. Took what you could get. Yeah. Um, and then I eventually started working in events for um, the government in healthcare and... Um, Is provincial government or federal? Provincial. Okay. And why the decision to go for more education after this? I just felt that in order for, to advance, I wanted to apply for jobs that had more responsibility and I could um, you know, further my career. I didn't have enough schooling, I didn't have a master's, and I also didn't have five to ten years experience that was required on all these job postings. So. I decided to risk leaving a government job, which is a, it was a pretty good job, you know, pensions, benefit, everything. Someone my age would be very happy to have, I'm sure, but I couldn't, I couldn't go further with it. So I took the risk and I went back to Ryerson to do my master's, and I'm hoping that my master's will now allow me to further my career and but apply for those jobs. But you're going on a different track now, I guess. So you're in communications I'm now? I'm in communications. So what do you want to do? Um, ideally, I'd like to get into broadcasting. Um, I love writing. Um, I love performing, so we'll see. It's my one-year master's. I have a year to figure it out. In Ontario, um, it's a pretty good sampling. And also, the you're trying to talk about the millennials, but it's a wide group, born over maybe a 15, 20-year period. So you know the story that Antoine had, uh, the senior in our group, <laughs> still very young, still very young. <laughs> Think of the moment he entered the labor market, just at the cusp of the uh, worldwide financial meltdown. And as it happens, 
he was absorbed in an industry that was growing widely at the time, financial mm -hmm. uh, sector. Um, so he was sucked into that orbit, as were many of my graduates uh, during that time. I started teaching actually in London at the height of the financial boom. London, so London England, England, at London okay. School of Economics. And I was teaching a range of students who were studying management, business, economics, wide range of interests. You'd think some of them would, might have been interested in marketing, for example. They all got hoovered up, as they say in England, mm -hmm. into the financial sector because that's where the jobs were. And guess what? 2008, the jobs weren't there. And gone. those people got laid off. So when you enter the labor market, it plays such a defining role, uh, can play such a defining role in, in where you end up. So um, the other story, the other kind of common element is the uh, sort of need or perceived need for a graduate degree in today's economy. And I think some of the uh, back and forth that went <laughs> between Laura and Sarah uh, was very useful. And I think you said something very important. Do you want to do it? Is it something that you've got a passion for? Because you're devoting time and money to something. And this is an issue that I think will be touched on in a few days from now in the same theme of Dude, Where's My Career? with the value of an education. Mm -hmm. But you should really pursue that kind of postgraduate degree if you find an affinity for it and you have a passion for it. Is your advice, don't worry about making a living. Find something you love? Very much so. Because look, here's the paradox. In our economy, we're always being told, left, right, and center, we need education that somehow mirrors what the economy is doing. If I told you in 1993 that you should have studied the internet, you would have said, what's the internet? Hmm. If I told you in 2007, go become an app developer, you would have said, what? Pardon my friend. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. But what, what is an app? So you cannot presume to base your life choices, and especially your educational choices, on what the market will bear. What you want to do is study something you find a passion and an affinity for, something that will develop other skills that are quite important, um, writing skills, communication skills. <laughs> This is the Education Return on Investment, a study that CIBC did. And what these bars show are what graduates earning less than half the median income are doing. And we in Canada, I don't know how many people know this, we have the largest percentage of our population with post-secondary education of all OECD countries. And yet we also have the largest chunk, if you compare us to the US, the UK, the OECD average, France and Korea, we have the largest chunk of both college and university graduates who are earning less than half the median income. College a little more than university, which is unusual because theoretically there's supposed to be the more direct line to a job with that. And who are these folks in particular who are dealing with this? Let's flip over to the next chart. And you can see it's the, it's the people with the psychology major, the humanities, the social sciences, and education who are the graduates in Canada who are earning less than half the median income. And obviously, as you get closer to, see Yvonne, there's engineering. Bridget, there's health. There's business as well. Uh, obviously, the numbers start to improve as you get closer to those kinds of occupations. But that, those, those charts seem to confirm what we instinctively hear all the time, which is, if you want to pursue your passion, and go into psychology or social <coughs> services or uh, philosophy, you're going to have a tougher time making a living. And I want to know why that doesn't deter you. <laughs> um, well, I mean, it does, because I know that I'm not going to be living the quality of lifestyle that I would like to for a long time. But I would much rather be happy and immersed in a culture that I enjoy than be working a nine to five behind a desk that's making me sad. I would, I would much rather be happy and broke and living in a crappy apartment than rich in a condo and hating my job every day. Braden, how about you? Well, I, it was always sort of instilled with me and I find this continues to be true. It doesn't matter what you study, what matters is what you do with it. Mm -hmm. um, and at the end of the day, uh, I have three degrees now in history and one in education. So, you know, I'm right on at the top of that list of uh, <laughs> cautionary tales, Listen, I guess you might you're, say. You're all full of humanities, aren't I'm you? I'm full of humanities, <laughs> uh, as, as well as other stuff sometimes. But anyway, uh, the, the issue is, right, is that um, if you look at that chart, the bottom end, where we mentioned, oh, business and engineering also show up on there. I think we forget that these, these trends have a kind of um, temporal aspect to them, in the sense that, you know, if you looked at teaching uh, say 10, 15 years ago, it's a very different picture, right? Grads were getting jobs. 
But what happened, uh, well, since about the end of the 90s, we've been producing four teachers for every single retiree because of the decision that was made by governments and universities to expand enrollment in those pro programs. Well, in, in part to meet a demand that people, people wanted those well, jobs. Not, not a demand on the education student side, not a demand in the labor market. And I'm not, I'm not making the argument that they need to necessarily entirely correlate, but come on, four teachers for every retiree, you can't tell me that you know, that was purely accidental or coincidental. I mean, it was clear that they were cashing in on the desire to be teachers, and that's what the decision that those universities made. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the other side of this, right, is that I'm already hearing whispers some, from some of my friends who have finished law, who've done other stuff, that schools are having trouble placing their articling students now, because they have too many of them. Because those programs have expanded too, especially since the Ray Report in 2005. Right, uh, where we've seen the number of people in graduate and professional programs literally double since 2005. Mm -hmm. So education, because it's a flat um, profession, is just sort of the tip of the iceberg. Well, the same thing is potentially coming down the pipe for others. I want to push fields. back a little bit here. Sure, and, absolutely. And, uh, if you learn more, you earn more. Every study shows that, sure. right? And if you go, now mind you, the, the gap in how much better you will do if you have post-secondary education is less now than it's been in many, many years. So it's not the advantage that it once was, but it's still an advantage. Absolutely. I mean, you, you can't imagine going back, I presume, right? No. You want that education. Yeah. Has it taken you, though, to where you thought or hoped you'd be at this stage of your life? Not 100%, not 100%, but kind of the other way I look at the idea of it and something that Rochelle had mentioned as far as the creation of your own job. So. I mean, once you've gone through university, there's so much we can look back and say, woulda, coulda, shoulda. You know, if I knew what I knew now, I would have done things differently. But you can't go back. And that's kind of where I look at it now. I would love to, you know, kind of do what um, Sia Vash is doing and go back to school and investigate, you know, media, a degree in media or, you know, English or journalism. But I don't think it's really that feasible. So for me, what it's been about is looking at what I have and what I can do now. And a large portion of that is what can I kind of create on my own? Universities seem today to be saying, come to us and we guarantee you're going to get a job at the end of the day. And they shouldn't be saying that, should no, they? No, I don't, I don't, I, I'm not sure these universities are saying they guarantee a job. I, I think there's, there's a mistake. But that's in, part of the pitch today. And that whole thing. They, Go the, into debt and we'll guarantee you a good job at the end of the day. No, the language is, if you come to this university, you will be prepared to take on this kind of work after you leave. That's a different thing than say we will guarantee. And several institutions in the states, mostly for private, uh, private for profit institutions, have gotten into trouble guaranteeing these type of things because it's contractual for some people. Right? Okay, but Raphael, even if not guaranteeing, yeah. They, yeah. they are incorporating some aspects of what we think of the college system as doing, more practical hands-on skills yeah. at universities, yeah. because they're trying to make that direct line between come to my institution, we'll get, guarantee a degree, at the, uh, guarantee yeah. a job at the end of it. Yeah. You can't do that. No, but it's a response to something else, I think. And it just sort of occurred to me that it's sort of a, in a weak economy, we hang on to what, where we can hold on to, right? Mm -hmm. So we're all struggling. These are low growth times. And when you have a low growth equilibrium, as we've had in Canada for the last uh, half decade, um, it's hard to generate new jobs. So people are graduating, not finding work. Not because they've chosen the wrong field, but because there's no demand. There's no growth potential. The work is not there to be had. Exactly. So as a response, I think universities feel pressure, and they respond with, OK, more internships, which are linked yeah. to getting yep. your first door, foot in the door. Better not be Lincoln. false advertising, though. No, they, they, it feels a bit like they, that. They, they, yeah. The programs that do, no, what the pressure comes from is to offer these programs that do, in fact, lead to a higher probability of job internships, changing the mm -hmm. format of your curriculum. Uh, I don't think they're lying, but I think you're right. They're repurposing university in a way that shouldn't. Uh, the college system was a great invention. Uh, in fact, William Davis, whose studio is named for it, was, you are in his was, studio. Exactly. was a, a right. brilliant thinker, very innovative in North America, one of the first jurisdictions to establish a college system. And college Oisey, system. by the way. And Oisey, and exactly. Oisey too. Right. Are, Why did they do oh. these things? Because they realized, yeah. even with a university degree, they might, there might be uh, jobs out there that require a technical ability. Mm -hmm. And that's where you do need indoctrination. You need to really understand the nuts and bolts of a specific uh, pursuit in order to do it well. well. And those are the jobs, those are the opportunities that we should be saying are attached to jobs. But I agree, the university should not be 
held to that standard. It's, it's a different Tony, thing. Yeah, I don't it, think so. In our last minute here, it gets back to one overarching question, which is should one's passion um, and one's work be the same thing? Yes, it's, it's, it's a very Robert Frostish sort of thing. <laughs> you know, your vocation and a vocation should somehow <laughs> melt as one. Um, and, and, and I think that's possible in post-secondary education. Of course, there's colleges and there's universities. When you ask the question about what universities should do, this is what universities should do. And I'm going to go out on a limb on this one. You've got 30 seconds to go out on it. I think we should create all programs that are very interdisciplinary. I think we should prepare students for a life that we don't understand right now, but a life where we're going to be constant learners mm -hmm. all the time, where we should be really sensitive and discerning about what problems exist and minds that can, that can address problems as they stand right now. And that should be both in business, education, architecture, and any discipline mm -hmm. should be multidisciplinary and not siloized and balkanized like, like we currently have. That sounds like terrific advice. If you had to, uh, Ra Ra, make a suggestion to, you, you've been here a while now, but let's talk about people who just arrived today. If you had to make a suggestion for them, who let's say were millennials like yourself, on how to smooth over this transition of coming to a new land, what would you suggest? Um, I think school is definitely a good, a good option, and I think in Canada it's a lot more affordable than it is elsewhere. Um, a lot of the social groups I was able to establish were entirely through school. Um, and if I didn't have that sort of social capital at the time, I, I don't know how I would have managed. Um, I think you know, putting yourself in situations where you're going to meet new people who are in more or less similar situations to you is, is a good way to, to establish a support group. Was there much of a Sudanese-Canadian community up at York? There wasn't. Uh, not a big Sudanese community in, in Toronto in general. Uh, but there were a lot of other East African immigrants. Uh, I made a lot of friends from other parts of the world who, who just ended up in Canada. Now, when you say friends, do you mean Facebook friends or people you actually knew and I met? I mean people who've been to my home. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> That's great. And that, you could tap into that, and that was helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Gotcha. Jemmy, how about you on that? Were you able to, to sort of give us some advice here on, let's say, the next Jemmy Joseph that comes across from... India, and then was it Kuwait that you went to next? Yes. And then Canada? Okay, yes. that person's going to hop off a plane at Pearson Airport this afternoon at 5 o'clock. Uh, what are you going to say? I think in addition to what Rara said, it's your social capital is good to help you get started, but sometimes there's a huge fear to integrate. And I think people need to understand that integrating does not necessarily mean giving up your past life or your cultural values and identity, you have the benefit. Having lived in different countries can add value to your time here in Canada. So you can really merge the best of both worlds. So education is a great way uh, to meet people outside your, what, uh, what might be your uh, network through your uh, social and cultural uh, communities. Um, putting your, uh, networking is very big in this country and that is important in terms of both for um, helping yourself economically, but also just learning the skills and uh, le helping yourself integrate into Canada. Um, seeking mentors have been a huge part of my personal development, and it took many years to find those mentors, but it doesn't have to be somebody famous. It can be your teachers in high school. Uh, to this day, I have to give them credit for the huge roles they played in my life. So seeking people that can give you honest guidance and feedback are also an important part of helping yourself uh, get established in this community. Do you have any mentors in healthcare now who are helping you to become a doctor? Um, healthcare is a bit challenging because there are many wonderful people that I look up to as mentors, but uh, given the schedules that doctors have, there are many who agree to be mentors, but to get a, a meeting even once a year can sometimes <laughs> be a challenge. No kidding. Hmm. They exist virtually, uh, but in terms of being able to <laughs> communicate with them as often as I would like to in order to at least uh, help me with some of the big decisions I have to make in the upcoming years about residency and employment and those kind of issues. Uh, it, it's been a challenge. Right. Michael, how about for you? If you were giving advice to somebody who was just coming uh, later this evening yeah. in from Hong Kong, what would you tell them? The decisions you make um, upon coming here is very important. So there are people who have been here for the same amount of time that I have, so say 16, 17 years, but their English would appear as though they just got here. So as you were mentioning the cultural enclaves, 
if you subscribe to that, um, even if you've been here for 20 years, you won't learn a word of English. And so reaching out and being proactive is very important. I read a lot of books, even when I didn't understand. I read simple books. I played a lot of games that were in English. And so growing up, uh, even though I wasn't necessarily surrounded by English-speaking kids at school, because I, I was a part of the cultural enclave, as you mentioned, um, but the fact that I have taken the time to pursue learning English on the side has allowed me to integrate myself much better into, into kind of this um, the society. And on your note about um, maybe building a business servicing your own cultural people, that's definitely the case, and that's how cultural enclaves are born. You come here, you don't know what you need, but you know that there's not enough Chinese food here, so you start a Chinese food uh, restaurant, and then everyone does the same thing. Chinese real estate agents sells yeah. real estate within the Chinese area, mm -hmm. and then this whole bubble comes out, and it's extremely difficult to get out of it. It's like immigrating again. Mm -hmm. You immigrated here, it was difficult enough, you found a place where you're comfortable, and to step out of that, it's, is that, it's so difficult. That's why people fall into those uh, designated career paths. So I would say that uh, entrepreneurship for me would not have been an option if I wasn't well-versed in English. Anything from dealing with partnerships or with clients or with investments, everything here, here is all done in English. And there's been research that's, uh, that's been done where if you don't speak proper English, people tend to assume you're less intelligent. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not that it's, a, it's not a logical, um, uh, uh, assumption, but that's how people perceive it. And when you can't speak proper English, it's very difficult to capture the opportunities that's available here in Canada. So imperative to have those good language skills the minute you arrive. Yes. Or quickly thereafter at the very least. As quickly as possible. Yes. Gotcha. Tracy, how about you? Well, uh, for me, I'm going to talk of my point as a refugee. I think just be patient. Um, Canada has a lot to offer, but it won't be easy. Like You won't just get it. You have to learn the language. I would say school also, but um, when you're a refugee, you, you face a lot of difficulties getting to school. Um, you don't have the permanent resident, you can apply for OSAB, you have to go. There's a lot of problems. Just be patient, uh, patient. go to a community um, community service. Um, if it's not, with, like just, just go somewhere and ask for help. Um, don't think that you're gonna learn it. Just, just don't take the advice from, from a friend or someone. Go to an expert, to someone that has been in Canada for for such an amount of time or, so, or like a community for myself going to, to the FCJ um, uh, and get the help that I needed. Um, going to now to the youth group, um, I have learned a lot from all the youth um, that I thought myself, I was the only one experiencing difficulties getting to school, getting a job, housing the language. But now that I have been a part of the FCJ Youth Network, I know that I'm not the only one. Hmm. So I think just um, be patient you you will find there is a future here canada has a lot to offer but it won't be all served right away you have to search for it you have to learn the language you have to adapt yourself to the culture respect the culture and just don't don't be on your own like oh i'm, I'm from mexico i'm just going to be on my own mexican tradition no just just go out there and explore and ask ask for help i must tell you you are and i mean this plural you are all plural optimism in the face of what you've all been through, and Tracy particularly in, in light of what you've been through, is astonishing. And I, uh, do you see this, Francisco, where people who've been through, you know, they've been to hell and back, and yet well, here they are, well, and they still have hope for the future. Well, Tracy is for me an inspiration, you know, because everything that has happened to her, and she never give up, she never give up. And, and in the youth group that we have in my organization, you have that pattern. You know, the kids come, they feel stuck because uh, they are not able to go to college because immigration status and whatever, and they continue trying to find a way. You know, it's unbelievable. Benjamin, where are you coming from on this? Well, I look at the numbers, uh, and the numbers are telling us uh, different stories. You know, first of all, let's look at youth unemployment. Youth unemployment is 14%. I what? got a graphic on that. Can yes. I interrupt long what? enough to put the Go graphic ahead. up? Absolutely. This is from StatsCan, August 2013, so these are very fresh numbers. The unemployment rate in Canada, 7.1%. In the province of Ontario, 7.5%. But the youth unemployment numbers, youth defined as 15 to 24, 14.1%. Exactly. That a, is that a crisis? 14.1%. What is the long-term average of youth unemployment in Canada? 14%. So we are at the long-term average. In fact, in the 80s, it was 20%. In the 90s, it was more than 15%. So we're actually relatively low. So what's the problem? 
The problem is that relative to the adult population, we are at a record high. So it's not the youth unemployment rate, it's relative to adults. So there are so many dimensions here because, for example... So there is no youth unemployment crisis in Canada today? Well, there is relative to employment among adults. So clearly, you have a situation in which the rate is misleading. You have to look at relative to adult where you are in the cycle. Now, why is it important? For example, I'll give you one number which is very important. Everybody is talking about this youth unemployment. However, if you look at people aged 15 to 18 that are students, namely they are in high school, mm -hmm. and you ask them, are you looking for a job? Many of them are saying yes. Can you find one? No. Then you are unemployed. If you take those unemployed high school students out of the calculations, What's the, the unemployment rate goes down from 19% for this group to 5%. Hmm. So what I'm saying is that if you are a high school student that is not happy with your allowances and you're unemployed because you're looking for a job, can you compare it to a 45-year-old person with five kids? No, you can't. Yeah. But on the other hand, if you're that 16-year-old kid whose parents uh, don't have a lot of money and you're going to be relying upon yourself to pay your university tuition, you're not being able to get a job is a real thing. That's exactly the issue. So this is a real problem. Now, why those young people cannot find a job? Because their parents have those jobs. Yes. And especially low quality jobs. Usually high school students go and work in restaurants but their parents are working in restaurants because the quality of employment among adult people has declined dramatically. So all of a sudden, the youth unemployment problem is actually a low quality of employment problem among adults. So that's one dimension of the problem. So you really have to look at the numbers. You mentioned youth unemployment 15 to 24. You know what? You cannot compare a 16-year-old person and a 22-year-old person. Sure. We have to break it into different segments. So you really have to look at the numbers and see where really the problem is. So again, we cannot distinguish just youth unemployment without looking at the labor market as a whole. Linda, do you want to follow up on that? I completely agree with everything that uh, Benjamin said. I, I think it's important that we, we, we cut out the and compare, uh, you know, 20 to 23 year old is a different group than a 15 to 16 year old. Uh, the only thing there I would differ is the, uh, I think there are high expectations in this, in these, uh, in the youth today. Uh, not necessarily in a sense of entitlement, as somebody said the other night, but there are high expectations. There's expectations with respect to the type of job that they're willing to take, expectations with respect to how much they're going to love the job, the first job that they get, to what extent the first job they get is going to fit perfectly with uh, the dreams that they've had and with the training that they've received. And uh, an expectation for lifestyle as well. And all of those things go together to make a f the future for very disappointed people. <laughs> It is a good thing to keep all of this in perspective. If we were having this conversation about millennials 100 years ago, it was worse being a millennial 100 years ago. You were going off to Europe to fight and die. And probably 70 years ago, same thing. If you were 23, 24 years old in 1939, you'd be going overseas as well to fight and potentially die. So that's not on the horizon for you guys today. That's a good thing. Uh, but how much of your success Roland, I'll ask you, how much of your success do you think depends on, as Benjamin said, the boomers retiring, getting out of the marketplace, uh, opening up those jobs, and dare I say, dying so that you inherit their money and their homes? So I actually fundamentally disagree with that. And I think it's a uh, overly simplistic view when people just say the boomers will retire and this whole young, these young people will step into their jobs for two reasons. The first reason why is there's a huge bottleneck right now. So even if the boomers retire, this bottleneck has been built up for a number of years and those that are not even practicing, such as if you get a license from OISE as a teacher, can come back into teaching. So the whole system is set up right now that it'll, it's gonna take many, many more years till we smoothen things out and even then, with political interests at stake, I don't know how many, how many uh, governments are willing to change the system. That's the first element. The second element, which no one really wants to talk about, is the, the impact of private sector. We've seen it with Caterpillar in, in Canada. We've seen it all over the world with globalization and the rise of information, information technology. We see it in CVS. We see it in home hardware. They are shipping jobs to wherever there is a lowest wage. They went to India, 
well, guess what? India's rising. So they went to Mexico. Mexico is one of the fastest rising economies. They're moving to Indonesia. They're moving to wherever they can get the lowest wages possible, though. So there is a huge glut of jobs. The low-wage jobs are, are moving somewhere else. And the jobs that there are here, people do not want to enter because of stigma, such as the vocations and the trades, or because, you know what, oil and mining, well, it doesn't really sound as sexy as, say, advertising and startups, though. So we need to do a fundamental rethink about how we're going to approach this problem. Grayson, I know you're not keen on my uh, attempt here to foster an intergenerational war, but I'm going to try again. How much of your, if I can put it this way, plan A for living the good life depends on the boomers getting out of the way so that the Gen Ys can take their place? Zero. Um, I actually, I agree with a lot of what, uh, what Roland was saying. Um, just about structural changes in the economy. So I don't necessarily think that people retiring is going to open up that many jobs because we saw with the recession that um, it forced people to downsize and then they learned how to operate more efficiently on a smaller um, number of employees and they just kept a smaller number of employees. So I think that really what we need to be looking for is opportunities to make our own work and um, to do so in a way that um, we can have a clean conscience with and uh, that's what I'm hoping to do with my future. Do you think so, the economy is structured in such a way as to allow you to do that now? Um, I'm figuring that out. You know, I just graduated so I, I am going to probably have a different story to tell in the future but um, yeah, I, I really believe in, in starting your own thing and I think it would be a real privilege for me one day to be able to hire my own people and I will hire millennials and I will hire boomers and I don't yeah I'll hire everyone. <laughs> David how much of uh, this generation's plan A involves the boomers getting out of the way? I think there's some but I also think I agree that there's structural changes that happening and, and to maybe give some positive to, to a lot of the negative that we've been talking about is that some of the, the, the leading innovation in, in the world today is being driven by millennials, right? Like Facebook, this was a millennial invention and has revolutionized not just you know, how we communicate and, and how we learn about each other, but how we sell things to each other, right? It's changing the, the, the way business is done. And so I have actually a lot of optimism that you know, the students I teach at Carleton or, or, or the, those that we talk to are incredibly uh, adaptive. So yes, they're struggling. And yes, they've got really high expectations. And they may not be landing where they think they're going to land when they're 25. But they're also really innovative. And you know what I always tell people is this is the first generation that had power over their parents in the sense of being the chief information officers of their household. They decided what modem we got, what you know cable package was the best, because their parents they're clueless on that. They stuff. delegated that yeah. decision to us. That was the first time, and we're seeing that in, in a number of other sectors in, in the economy. So I'm, I'm actually, I think there will be opportunities opened up when my parents finally decide to retire. There's going to be a little more. We're also going to have to pay for that retirement, which is a whole other public policy problem that governments haven't figured out yet because millennials don't vote. And until that focus shifts to how am I going to pay my, how are my tax dollars? going to pay for all those social services that my parents are going to suck up when they get old and are going to live a long, long time, uh, I hope, Mom. Um, <laughs> you know, we don't have an answer to those questions yet. And that is the Agenda's Week in Review. You can see all of those programs in their entirety on our website, that's theagenda.tvo.org, on our iTunes channel or on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash theagenda. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.